very grateful that the senator has taken the time to come to see us. He uh, has a fascinating career path which has well prepared him for the job he's taking. He was actually raised abroad. His parents were uh, working for the government in various capacities, and so he was actually born in Pakistan and spent time in Turkey, India, and Sri Lanka. So, you know, we don't have to worry about him having an international perspective and in placing the United States in the world context, which is so important today. He uh, did his uh, undergraduate training at Swarthmore in philosophy. He went to the Kennedy School at Harvard for a master's of public policy and then got a JD law degree at uh, Georgetown. He uh, has been active in politics in the state of Maryland for many years, working with Senator Mac Mathias on uh, various committee assignments. Um, he was then um, elected to the House of Delegates here in the state where he served for several years in the uh, 1990s. He moved to the state Senate. Uh, and then in 2003, he was elected to the House in Montgomery, nearby Montgomery County here, where he served until 2017. And we're very pleased to congratulate him on his election last fall to the United States Senate seat that was vacated by Senator Barbara Mikulski, someone uh, well known to all of us and near and dear to our heart. Um, but Senator Van Hollen, though, has taken up the mantle for uh, many important uh, uh, government programs and ways in which to improve this state so that we move forward in a way that uh, reflects the knowledge economy that has been so well nurtured in this state. And uh, we hope to see him continue to champion those uh, sorts of challenges, especially in the current age where uh, the public discourse, I think you can say, is not characterized by a deep knowledge at present. And we hope that will improve uh, so that we can address our difficult issues. So without further ado, I'd like to invite President Wallace Lowe uh, from the University of Maryland to give his greetings. And then we'll have uh, the senator and professor. Uh, thank you very much, Dean Ball, and to the entire University of Maryland community and guests. Welcome to the 2017 Sadat, uh, uh, our Sadat uh, Peace and Development Forum. This is the 20th year of this forum, and it has been led remarkably well by our distinguished professor, Shibli Dalhami, who will be participating in this conversation with Senator Van Hollen. As you all know, Senator Van Hollen is a national voice on important issues of the day and a very, very special friend and advocate for the University of Maryland and, of course, for the state of Maryland. So please welcome Senator Van Hollen and Professor Talhami. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I know this is a special place for you, and you're a special person in this place. So uh, this is home to you. I know how uh, much you care about the state and about this institution and about our country. Uh, allow me first passing over your father-in-law, uh, Edward H. Wilkins, um, uh, who is the father of uh, Catherine. I, uh, and you, uh, uh, over the years, a couple of times, I, I've met him at least. Uh, and I know he's had a distinguished career uh, in the FDA, uh, and uh, he will be missed. And I know that uh, he's been very important to you personally. Really offer our deep condolences uh, that he passed yesterday. And uh, I'm, I'm doubly grateful for you to make the effort to join us today uh, under the circumstances especially. Thank you, Shibley. Well, thank you. and. First of all, thank you for remembering uh, my father-in-law, uh, Ed Wilkins. It is really great uh, to be with all of you uh, today. And I think that he would have uh, appreciated the fact that we're here to talk about important public issues. Uh, he worked for the Food and Drug Administration uh, for many years uh, and had a good career as an inspector and worked in different capacities uh, there. And they wrote a, a little history at the FDA, and he was one of the longest servant, serving public servant, so I'm, I'm grateful. I just want to say to all of you, and I'm not trying to embarrass uh, Shibley here, but we are very lucky to have 
uh, Shibley as the Sadat chair uh, here at the University of Maryland. And he mentioned my wife, Catherine. Um, I actually first got to meet Shibley when uh, he was working on the House Foreign Affairs Committee uh, for Congressman Lee Hamilton. And my wife, Catherine, uh, was also uh, working on the House Foreign Affairs Committee for Congressman Lee Hamilton. And she said one day, there's this brilliant guy uh, who knows all sorts of uh, areas of foreign policy, and especially, of course, uh, on, on the Middle East. And um, I think you probably know it, but you really do have a world-renowned uh, leader here and thought leader and someone whose advice is sought after. And I can promise you I didn't mean to embarrass you, Shibley, but I thought I, thought I would say that because um, we followed your work as well. well it's really so great much. to be here with all of you Terps uh, and Dr. Lowe, uh, thank you for your leadership. Uh, it's uh, been great to work with you on all sorts of uh, things for the university. Dean Ball, thank you for your leadership. And really, I'm looking um, across the room, and I see many uh, friends we've worked with uh, for a very long uh, time. I see Mac Dessler here. I, I better stop there, and uh, good to see you, Mac. And uh, to the, all the students here, uh, I look forward to a good conversation. Um, first with Shibley, and then trying to answer any questions that uh, you may have. Well, thanks so much uh, for, for the kind words. Um, uh, let's start with what we're all facing, uh, that deep war in Congress. Obviously, that, that is visible there uh, every day of the week, I'm sure, for you. Uh, but really, across the country, I mean, you can see that we are a divided country. Uh, and not just across partisan lines, certainly across partisan lines, but it seems to go even deeper than that. And people have been talking about identity politics, uh, and I'm not sure what identity, because we're talking about multitudes of identities at play. Uh, as you know, we do public opinion polls here at the University of Maryland. I know we share those with you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have never, in all the years that we've been doing public opinion polls, I have never seen the kind of divide that we now see on almost every major issue of the day. Um, so I want to ask you uh, whether from your perspective, where you're sitting in Congress, uh, dealing with the White House and dealing with the colleagues, both your Demo Democrat, Democratic colleagues and, and, and those across the aisle, um, whether, this is a diff whether, whether it is really different from previous years. I mean, we, we have a sense that it's deeper uh, we are talking about it in ways we have not talked about before, uh, and yet uh, we are, you know, is it really as different as it seems from, from previous year? What's different for you? Um, not only in the Senate, obviously this is your first term in the Senate, you, uh, you and the President arrived at the same time, That's right. um, and, but you've been in the House for, for many years in the leadership position and have had to deal with this uh, over time. So what's different today? So I do think it's different. And I said at the outset that I first met Shibley when he was working on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. That was probably in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Um, at the time, and this was long before I was thinking of running for any office uh, myself, I was actually on the staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee as uh, was mentioned. You know, my father was in the Foreign Service. My mother was a real partner in that, and she was focused on foreign policy, grew up in many different parts of the world. And so I was very focused on foreign policy and, and nuclear arms control uh, in those kind of issues. And while there were deep differences on Capitol Hill between Republicans and Democrats on foreign policy issues, although a little less so in those areas, but deep differences in policy on domestic issues, you didn't get the sense of the kind of gridlock and division you see on Capitol Hill today, and probably more relevant to the conversation, you didn't see that division and polarization expressed in the way you're seeing it now around the country. I think you've always had, obviously, big differences around the country. But what is making it different, ne different now, and you know, I don't think it's just, I don't think this is a sort of partisan perspective, I think it's backed up by a lot of the, the data, uh, is you do have a, a president who ran a campaign for president in a very divisive way, right? We all know how we started the campaign, coming down the escalator, talking about Mexican rapists, and it goes on and on.
But then after the campaign, most presidents, even if it's been a bitter campaign, decide during their presidency to try to bring the country together. And instead, in my view, we've seen something very different uh, in this president, uh, sort of a very calculated effort to shore up his political base through division. Uh, and that's reflected in everything from the nature of his policies, um, you know, like the original travel ban and the Muslim ban, which of course he said during the campaign he wanted to do, the response to the, uh, what happened in Charlottesville, sort of saying, well, you know, everybody's at fault instead of clearly laying blame uh, with those who were perpetrating hate. And then more recently, uh, just getting involved in a debate that was totally of his own choosing, uh, going after uh, the NFL for not throwing out players uh, who wanted to express themselves uh, during the pledge. So I, I think what you're seeing is a, a deliberate calculated effort uh, because it helps shore up the base, however uh, small. And I will say that there have been very measurable results. I mean, we have seen a spike in hate crimes around the country, um, both in the immediate run-up to the uh, election, uh, during a lot of the comments made during the election, and since then, uh, because of the fact that we haven't really come together. Now, that doesn't, just to finish the point, that doesn't necessarily create polarization. There are always tensions in society, but it exploits them and, I would argue, makes them worse um, and brings out uh, the worst uh, that's out there rather than trying to bring us together to bring out the best. Well, it certainly intensifies. And what we found in the polls, just to give you an example, is on the question, for example, of Islam, Islamophobia, where uh, as you know, uh, the rhetoric of the campaign during the entire campaign year and since uh, has been very Islamophobic. And in, in a sense, you'd expect that uh, it'll have an impact. Well, what we found in the polls is actually exactly the opposite, that more people have become to say they have favorable view of Islam and Muslims than in the past uh, because they were reacting uh, and, but most of that change happened among Democrats and independents, <laughs> not among Republicans. And so what you had, is the intensity increases, not that you have more Islamophobes in the country, in fact you have fewer, actually, according to that. It is just those people who held those views are expressing them more intensely and sometimes, unfortunately, more violently. But put aside the Trump factor. I, think, I don't think you're gonna have a disagreement across the board that there's a Trump factor. And Republican or Democrat, they're gonna say there's a Trump factor. But partisanship isn't just a creation of Donald Trump. Uh, and gridlock in Washington preceded Donald Trump, and in fact may have led to the anti-establishment mood, mood that sure. elected Donald Trump. So there is a deep partisanship that was reflected in various ways that people are very frustrated about. Uh, and I wonder um, how, whether there's anything new in that. Now, my colleague, uh, Francis Lee, who I think is sitting here, uh, one of the prominent Americanists in, in, in my department, wrote a, a paper uh, recently um, saying, you know, th there's been partisanship for a long time, but what was different is that in earlier history, th there was party dominance. One party dominated for long periods of time. In the Republican Party, Democrat Party, Democratic Party. And what we now have is more parity between Democrats and Republicans. We have, we're going through a period of more parity, of flip-flopping from Democrat to Republican, and in some ways it is leading to uh, more tension between governing and electioneering. And so uh, the minute we have a president elected by one party, Republican or Democrat, Democratic, you're gonna have the other party start preparing for the next day of election to defeat him rather than to deal with issues. Maybe a factor, but even before Trump, you were there uh, for many years in the House and obviously through the entire era of the Obama administration. I think that's a very good point. And I would argue that President Trump is not responsible for the current gridlock in Congress. I would argue he's responsible for what your polls reflect, which is not necessarily 
increased polarization in the electorate generally, but certainly an intensification, and I would argue some increase in the population, which is reflected in the statistics by the Southern Poverty Law Center and others, uh, which I think is uh, obviously incredibly destructive and, and very real. So in, in Congress, I think there are a, a number of things. I, I would agree with the theory uh, that's been put forward that uh, you, today you do, you've not seen a long run of sort of one party control in Congress, right? For a long period of time, you had Democrats dominating mm -hmm. the Congress. You had presidents uh, come and go, uh, but you had one party dominating the Congress. Uh, I would also argue that congressional redistricting, which people have talked a lot about, uh, is a, a part of this. Uh, because it doesn't apply so much to the Senate, obviously, because we don't have, you know, we, people run statewide. But there's no doubt that congressional districts uh, are now drawn with incredible partisan precision. I mean, computers can tell you, you know, household by household as you move uh, a, a, something on the computer, on the screen, and you can essentially draw your district. As people say, you now have you know, elected officials, politicians picking their voters rather than voters picking their elected officials. And obviously there's always a, you know, there's always some uncertainty and dynamic in these elections, but pretty much uh, you can predict uh, once you get a congressional district drawn that has, you know, more than a certain number of registered Republicans or Democrats based on their voting, past voting patterns. And that has made it much more difficult uh, in, in, in the House, certainly, uh, because what that means is the primary competition in elections is not in the general elections. They're in the primary elections. And what happens in many cases as a result uh, is those who are sort of on the farthest extreme, it applies to both parties, but uh, more recently, and I think my Republican colleagues would agree with me, you've seen more of this phenomena on the right. In fact, we just had a <laughs> special election primary in Alabama uh, between uh, Roy Moore and the, quote, establishment candidate from Alabama, the incumbent Senator Luther Strange. And you saw this polarization in a primary playing out uh, there in Alabama, a very recent uh, example. So bottom line is when people are playing more to the extremes than uh, toward where the majority is in a district because they know if they win the primary, they're likely to win the general that does make it more difficult. I always say if you run on a platform of no compromise, <laughs> then if you're gonna deliver on your promise, people get gridlock. So um, if, if you look at the, the Trump factor, um, he has uh, surprised people by reaching out to Democrats on a couple of issues over his own party. Uh, how new is that and what, what's behind that? How, how, what's your read as a Democrat in, in the Senate, uh, and, and what, is that promising, or is this just a kind of an exercise, a political exercise that's short term? I, I, don't, I don't know if it's promising. My guess is it's uh, sort of a sort of tactical spur of the moment uh, decision. I mean, my reading of uh, this president is, uh, you know, he, he is all about what he thinks is best for Donald Trump. That's true of all presidents, but he's much more willing to you know, throw uh, his party under the bus uh, if he thinks it's convenient for him uh, at the particular moment. And at that moment, uh, he was very upset at the fact that you know, the Republican majority in the Senate had not succeeded in destroying the Affordable Care Act uh, and expressed those frustrations in the way he did. I should say there, there were two instances so far of mm -hmm. that kind of agreement. Uh, one had to do with the, the budget, uh, where the, the big question was how long are we going to keep the government open, and especially for how long are we going to extend the, the debt ceiling, the ability of the United States to pay its debts on time. Um, this is, for those of you who are not familiar with this, the United States is one of the very few countries where the Congress actually has to vote in order for the United States to be able to pay the bills that are currently due and, due and owing, right? This is not about expanding your ability to borrow, it's about your ability to, to pay the current obligations on time. In any event, there was a tactical issue. Republicans wanted to kick that beyond the next election. Democrats wanted a shorter period. 
Trump agreed with us. And finally, and more importantly, of course, from a substantive point of view, is the at least supposed agreement in principle on dealing with uh, the DACA students, with the Dreamers. Uh, and we are pushing very hard to hold President Trump to his commitment, which was to pass the Dreamers Act, which is a very specific piece of legislation in the United States Congress. And we did agree that we can work to strengthen border security, which we have no problem with, but we also believe that a wall is a waste of money. And the president at that meeting agreed that the agreement would not require the building of a wall. Not that he was gonna give up on that idea, but we could do that separate from this agreement. So we are all gonna be pushing very hard uh, now to hold them uh, to that. So, I, but to your larger question, I think it's, I think it's sort of wait and see. I think it, right for now it's a, a sort of, a, 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 it's not a pattern, right? It's just a, a, a moment. So uh, Trump is unique, as I said, and I think you agree, but um, the, the circumstances under which he was elected, uh, the sort of things that were expressed by the public that led to success of Bernie Sanders on, on the Democratic side and to Trump on the Republican side. Uh, we had all sorts of theories uh, during, uh, during the elections uh, that we haven't come back to as much since uh, about the anti-establishment mood, about the system is rigged mood uh, that again was tied to the fact that something was wrong with the country that seemed to be pervasive across the political divide. So yes, there was partisanship, and people had different answers to it. Well, Trump provided one set of answers, uh, Sanders and Democrats uh, provided another set of answers, but in the end, there was something real that was motivating people. What is that? Oh, I think it's a very deep-seated and real uh, frustration over the lack of economic mobility. Uh, that we've seen uh, over a period of a long time now. This is not a recent phenomenon. The frustration's been building. If you look at a, a chart of income rising versus worker productivity over years, uh, you'll find that up until the, really the late 1970s, as worker productivity rose, so did median wages it, quite rapidly. They, they kind of tracked each other. Now we've been in a long stall for people who are in the middle and those who are struggling to find their way into the middle, even though worker productivity continued to increase, although in the last couple of years you've seen another slowdown. But over a long period of time, worker productivity increased. But you saw the gains from that worker productivity going disproportionately to folks at the very top, right? The, the top 1%. Everybody else was kind of flat. You know, we just kind of, you know, People were celebrating a little bit that within the last couple of months, you'd finally seen median incomes rise a little bit compared to the last five or six or years or more. But they rose to a point where they're still having, they're, they're about where they were now, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. So people feel like they're, not just feel, I mean, they are on an, on an economic uh, escalator where they're trying to run up and the escalator keeps going down and they're working harder and harder and they're running in place. I think that has led to very deep-seated uh, and understandable frustration, and I think that Donald Trump was able to punch through uh, on that issue. Voters who switched from Barack Obama, right? Voters who voted for Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012 and for Bernie Sanders in this last election, that's what you find yeah. among a lot of them. Uh, and Bernie Sanders was also speaking to many of those uh, voters as well. And I, I do think that the Democratic Party as a party uh, has sort of neglected um, and certainly was not effective at communicating our, our message there. Let me just give you a, a Maryland example. Um, if you go to, I don't know how many of you um, have been down to Sparrows Point where Bethlehem Steel used to be. It's in Baltimore County. It used to be the home of Bethlehem Steel, employed at its heyday. 15 to 20,000 workers, good union paying jobs. Um, it sputtered out over a period of time, declared bankruptcy. When Donald Trump came to Maryland in the presidential election, he went to Dundalk, he went to uh, 
Sparrows Point uh, area. And he, he actually got a very solid vote from that area. People who worked hard all their lives or their, and, and hoped that their kids would have a, a good you know, opportunity, and then everything went bust. Uh, and there is understandable deep-seated frustration, uh, and Donald Trump did, did capitalize uh, on that. Uh, no question, and I happen to agree with that, but if you look at where we are now, uh, obviously Donald Trump isn't getting things done for sure, but on the other hand, he's dictating the agenda of the conversation. He's shifting it from one issue to another issue. He's dictating the conversation. Is this making Democrats uh, uh, you know, sort of distracted from addressing this core issue that is uh, of concern to uh, the rest of the population, whether it's you know, across the board. Uh, you have people like Steve Bannon, uh, who as you know, think this is all about economic nationalism as the answer to, to the problem, uh, saying, well, if the Democrats wanna play identity politics, uh, they can have it, I'll play uh, economic nationalism every day and I'll win we will win, we, we the Republicans. Now maybe it's not economic nationalism, that's his answer, but is, isn't the distraction of the issue and, and, and the conversation moving from one issue to the other that, that Trump is creating? You know, as soon as we move away from one, now it's the tax, uh, the tax proposal, which we haven't seen yet. But uh, yesterday it was uh, the healthcare issue and, and the day before it was another issue and it was the NFL and there, there's, now it's Puerto Rico. And, and so we're hopping, and every time he's dictating the conversation, and it's not allowing the Democrats to take a lead in defining a substantive conversation that appeals to the public. Is it enough to be anti-Trump? Well, two things. First of all, he can, with the tweet, obviously, uh, create a whole different conversation uh, around the country. Look, we saw that right after uh, it, you know, Republicans didn't get the votes to, you know, blow up the Affordable Care Act. Uh, he went down to Alabama, made the comment about uh, the NFL, and of course that's been the subject of conversation for a long time. So uh, there's no doubt he can do that. I, I would just say as a general matter, however, whoever's in the White House, especially when they control both houses of Congress, has a big advantage in controlling the conversation. Uh, and certainly if you control both houses of Congress, you control the congressional agenda. I mean. Democrats you know, would like to have taken up legislation to modernize our infrastructure. We'd like to deal with a lot of uh, the issues. In fact, we, we put forward pretty substantive plans, but I wouldn't, I'd, I wouldn't expect anybody to know a whole lot about them right now because you're right, they haven't been the focus of conversation. However, we do think it's useful uh, for us to have a, a platform to you know, reduce the cost of prescription drugs and uh, to talk about our own version of our tax plan. We have an infrastructure modernization plan. So I, I don't think, certainly when you're going into a presidential election, it's not enough to be anti-Trump. I mean, it's really important that whoever the Democratic nominee for president is in 2020 um, has a bold vision for the country. For a midterm election, it is, it's, it's important that certainly every senator running for re-election or every challenger uh, have a strong platform for their state. It's also, I think, valuable uh, for them to have the backdrop of a Democratic Party agenda that's focused on lots of things but has a strong economic component to it. But midterm elections tend to be referendums on the presidency. In 2006 and 2010, big swing midterm elections, uh, that was the case. I remember in 2006, it was when you know, President Bush was president. Uh, the Democrats, we put forward our 6 for 06 agenda and we thought it was important to have it, but make no mistake, 2006 was about the Iraq war primarily. Uh, it was also about their plan to privatize Social Security. 2010, you had Barack Obama in the White House, you had Democrats in control of the House and Senate, the economy was still on the skids. Uh, and people were saying, hey, you know, they're in control. The economy isn't, you know, hasn't bounced back yet. And there were other issues too. So midterms tend to be a referenda on the party in power in the White House and certainly when you have Republicans also controlling both houses of Congress on them as well. Well, I'm gonna segue to uh, an issue in which partisanship is very clear at the public level and also at the you know, congressional level and that is uh, the travel ban. 
uh, something that you have taken a very decisive position on from, from the beginning. Um, and I could tell you that on, in the poll that we did, the national poll that we did a few months ago, uh, there is more division in America about this issue than almost any other issue. America is divided down the middle. Almost 90% of Democrats oppose the ban, the, the original version of it, and almost 90% of Republicans support the ban. And independents are divided 50-50. I mean, you can't have, you know, this is like two countries. Yeah. I mean, as deep a divide as you can ever find on any issue of the day. Now, um, I know you've taken a very strong position, uh, obviously on the old version, but you weren't the only one. The courts did. And obviously, that was one of the major obstacles it faced. Now we have a revised travel ban uh, that people say is harder for courts to oppose in part because it includes not only Muslim-majority countries, in part because it's supposed to have reflected some national security consideration, although the addition of Chad, as you know, has been criticized for hurting national security, uh, including by uh, voices from, from, the, from uh, the Pentagon and the Department of State. So what's your thought on this new version of the travel plan? What's different here? And do you think it has a better shot uh, of, 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 of uh, holding? So there, there are two issues on the travel ban. One is the legal question, right? What are the courts going to say about it? And the other is the policy question. So let me tackle the policy part of it first. I thought the first one was totally counterproductive from a policy perspective, and I think the second one is equally counterproductive from a policy perspective. Neither of them, in my view, adds at all to our national security. In fact, I think there are strong arguments to be made that our opponents will use them to try and further their narrative uh, that the United States just wants to exclude, exclude people, especially Muslims, which is a argument that tries, you know, people try to res resonates. I mean, ISIS uh, was using the earlier version to try to recruit uh, people to its uh, ranks. The reality is that uh, the, the, it, we have the strongest vetting provisions by far of any country that were already in place under President Obama. In my view, the first travel ban was simply his effort to put into effect his statements during the campaign that he was going to have a Muslim ban, and he couldn't call it that because he knew if he called it that outright, it would be no question about whether it would survive review in the courts. Uh, so they, you know, they called it something else, but the reality was the courts saw through that. In this next one, I don't know enough about whether or not it will survive legal scrutiny or not. Obviously, there are going to be a whole round of lawsuits uh, that have filed, but as also, you also know the Supreme Court has now asked everybody to, and they've asked people to brief on this most recent uh, one as well. I think this one is, from a policy perspective, just as harmful and certainly doesn't strengthen our, our security. I think it's another political, it's another political response. Um, you know, this, he, to your earlier point, I mean, he did go around the country saying he was going to do this in the campaign. Um, and, you know, and he's president, he's put this together and for legal reasons tried to call it something else, but uh, I don't think there's any secret that that was an effort to deliver on what he had said uh, in the campaign. In terms of overturning it, if the courts don't overturn it, uh, we do have efforts in the Congress, uh, a number of efforts to defund it. But I have to, I have to say that in this environment, uh, the prospects of that passing the Congress, uh, an effort to overturn it or defund it, are very remote. I do want a little addendum here, though, because this is one of those issues where I'm sure there were already strong differences within the country, but they have definitely been on this issue uh, deepened uh, and intensified by Donald Trump. And the reason I say that is if you talk to many of my Republican colleagues in the Senate, <laughs> they will tell you that they don't think this was a very good idea from a national security perspective. They don't think, and a lot of them also would argue that you know, dramatically reducing the number of refugees the United States takes in. Um, is not something the United States should be doing given our leadership position in the world. And so, at least quietly on Capitol Hill, uh, I hear from a lot of Republican senators who are not 
you know, they're not wild at all or enthusiastic about what the president's doing, but because of the polarization in the country, they don't want to say it out loud back home because they'll get clobbered certainly by the pro-Trump faction within the Democratic Party. And, you know, I mentioned Alabama. As we speak, there are lots of Republican primaries shaping up around the country between the pro-Trump faction in their states and the, quote, establishment faction in these states. Lots of examples around the country. Um, you know, the, as you know, the travel ban even affected uh, us too here at, on campus because you know we obviously have uh, 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 students, staff, uh, faculty from a number of countries, and, and it's affected every campus uh, pretty much of major uh, major university. Uh, another issue that has affected us here uh, that we have felt in, in, in terrible ways uh, is race relations, uh, and and I say that with a you know in a, in a uh, it's been a painful issue to many of us uh, to, to witness what has transpired. Now, on the one hand, uh, you know, as you suggested, uh, maybe the driving forces behind the election were economic mobility much more than race issues per se. Uh, and and uh, President Obama, as he left office, he warned against labeling all Trump supporters uh, as racist and, and, and to focus on that you know, economic aspect and reach out to them, good advice. But we've seen racism in ways that we haven't seen. Uh, uh, we, are, we are a diverse campus that's proud of its egalitarian norms. Um, and we had one person in our midst. Uh, it, it was a shock to us, uh, a horror to us, a shame to us that someone in our midst would is suspected of having carried out a hate crime uh, on, on our own campus last spring. A, and, and so, and we've seen manifestations of this. Uh, we've seen it in, in terms of, uh, you know, signs left in dormitories, whether they're uh, uh, anti-Semitic or racist, anti-black or anti-Hispanic or Islamophobic. Uh, uh, Fortunately, it hasn't been widespread, but we've even, in, I say, even in a place like this, where we have these strong egalitarian norms and very uh, diverse campus, we, we faced it. We've seen what happened in Charlottesville. Uh, uh, manifestation all of the above. Uh, uh, race, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, all coming together. Uh, and, uh, and, and we, even as you suggested, the, 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 the whole issue of the NFL started not over the flag uh, or the anthem. It was to protest uh, police brutality against African Americans that revealed in videos across all too often. So I didn't, I didn't know my country that well, it turns out, maybe even my own community that well. And so how do we deal with this in the face of this partisanship? I mean, how do you deal with this in Congress? Surely, uh, Republicans and Democrats both can see this as disastrous for, 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 for the nation, and yet no one has come together uh, to, to put forth a plan to deal with this. So what are your thoughts on this? So first, uh, I attended the uh, funeral of Richard Collins, uh, who was the Bowie State University student who was killed, and it was an incredible uh, tragedy, and I know that uh, the University of Maryland has been working hard to try to bring the community together, but more than that, we've got to figure out how we actually uh, change some of these dy dynamics, and that does require leadership, and I, 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 I want to do point out where leadership matters on this, because uh, I want to, we should get to the question about what it is that Trump is sort of exploiting and tapping into, but leadership requires that we try to move forward as a country to overcome our flaws. I mean, it's been a long road we've been traveling from the, you know, the original sin of slavery and through the civil rights movement, and as a country, we need to constantly be doing better. We've come a long way, but we got a long way to go. When 9-11 happened, you had President George Bush, and boy, I disagree with President George Bush on, a, uh, on most things, 
But he went to the mosque in Washington, D.C., and he told America, Islam is not our enemy. Muslims are not our enemy. Al-Qaeda is a perversion of Islam. They're the enemy. I remember when John McCain was running for president. He was at a campaign rally, and when one of the women in the crowd came up and sort of said something about Obama, oh, he's an Arab or something, as if, you know, as if that was a, a bad thing, number one. But what John McCain said was, you know, let's, we're not going there. Right? We're, not, we're not going there. Trump's been all about going there first and fast. And so that is why you see, uh, e even if the numbers show that more Americans today or about the same America think positively about Islam, he has polarized it because, you know, on a, you just said, along partisan lines. Uh, and uh, that is very different because most presidents try to pe bring people together. I mean, we have policy fights over health care policy or tax policy, but on the fundamental question of, you know, we are a, a diverse country where we try to bring everyone together and for liberty and justice for all, uh, that has been very, very different. And that's why you see this spike uh, in, in hate crimes. Now, as a country, we have a more fundamental issue is why is he able to exploit that's the these things? And yeah, I know you're exactly I, I getting that, but I, yeah. think, but I think, again, yeah. the reason you're seeing the mm -hmm. spike in the expression of this is because of Trump. Now, getting at the underlying issue, we've just got a whole lot of work to do as a country. And, you know, there's no doubt that the, uh, you know, we've seen uh, police brutality and we've seen many instances uh, where uh, police are not held accountable. Now, I, we, I, I do want to stress, and I think all of my, my friends who are part of our movement together in this would agree, that most police are out there trying to do the best job that they can. But there are clearly police out there who are abusing their authority. And clearly, we still have systemic racism, which results in a disproportionate number of, in this case, mostly African Americans being the victims of police brutality. We need to take proactive measures. What do we need to do? We need to have better community policing. We need better training. We need to make sure that we have transparency. We're trying to get more cameras on police because the truth should benefit everybody in these situations. And then we have to get at fundamentally deep issues of disparity in the country that begin with unequal education systems uh, in our school systems and our uh, you know, access to things like after school opportunities, a whole lot of things. And these are uh, subjects of big um, issues that, you know, I've put forward many issues in Congress, but that's where the political process uh, has got to fight itself out. And ultimately the expression of that is in, in these elections. Uh, and so um, to, the, to the root of your question, we've just got a whole lot of work to do uh, as a country, and it's harder uh, when you have a president uh, who is trying to exploit and deepen these differences for political uh, purposes, uh, which is clearly the case with you know, the NFL statement and response to Charlottesville Anyway, just, let's just remember, this is the guy who started his political career by saying that the president, <laughs> you know, he was, a, he was he helped the birther movement, Trump did, right? I mean, so, uh, but two separate issues. One is we should not have a president exploiting these differences. Number two, as a country, we just have a whole lot of work to do, um, both on police brutality, but the deeper issues involved in disparity in educational opportunity, income inequality, wealth inequality. These are huge issues that our country has to deal with. Um, I'm going to um, ask you just a couple of foreign policy questions uh, before I open it up for, um, for the audience questions. Um, and obviously, some of the hot issues that we're facing now that we're all dealing with, and starting with North Korea. So um, uh, we have seen, obviously, um, a, a dictatorship that has uh, developed uh, its uh, nuclear capabilities and uh, intercontinental ballistic miss missiles that may uh, possibly reach uh, the U.S. Uh, that obviously has, in and of itself, created a lot of worries and concerns. Uh, but we've also had this incredibly heated rhetoric, the likes of which we have never seen before. Uh, uh, and that has led people to be truly worried, because normally, 
uh, we're worried, but we're analyzing it through the prism of deterrence and threat and, and so forth. And now we're worried about uh, uh, things like miscalculations and uh, uh, something that might be on surprises and, and, and something that's not expected. Uh, you have taken a, um, uh, a lead in tightening sanctions on North Korea. Uh, and, uh, and I'm just wondering, if you look at the options that we have, number one is, um, how do you see the military option? Is this, really, is this really a serious option that people are talking about, given the unthinkable consequences for any degree of military operation? Uh, and, and two, um, if, you, uh, if we increase the sanctions and tighten them, um, for what end? What, what would what would we expect North Korea to do if uh, if we apply more sanctions? So, to your first question, as you as you suggested, the military option has catastrophic uh, human costs. Uh, I mean, you would see potentially millions of people uh, on the Korean Peninsula die. You've got. 28,000 American soldiers there. You've got 50,000 American soldiers in Japan. So on top of the death toll in South Korea and North Korea and potentially in Japan, um, you also have American lives that would be directly triggered. And um, we should care about the lives of our allies and our, and our fellow countrymen uh, as we're making these decisions. And so miscalculation uh, is what we worried about most, uh, especially when you get into the heated rhetoric uh, part, because I do subscribe to the Teddy Roosevelt maxim, which is speak softly, but carry a, a big stick. And that's the next part of that. The sanctions, ratcheting up the sanctions, and I should say enforcement of the sanctions. You know, there's a big difference between having a international sanctions regime or US sanctions and actually enforcing those sanctions, right? It's the difference between having the authority to do something and actually doing it. And the reality is that the UN sanctions, at least until very recently, were very spottily enforced. Um, and the legislation I've proposed, it's bipartisan legislation, would really help ratchet down the pressure on those who are do it, continuing doing business with North Korea, which are primarily some of the Chinese banks and Chinese firms. And I think everybody knows that if you actually ever want to get North Korea to the negotiating table, uh, you got to have the Chinese involved. So to what end? The, the end of increasing economic pressure on both North Korea and increasing pressure to get China to help us get to the negotiating table uh, is to reduce the threat. Now, the ultimate goal on the Korean Peninsula is denuclearization. Um, back in the 1990s, the U.S. actually had tactical nuclear weapons on the ground in South Korea. We withdrew those. But now you have North Korea. Uh, obviously, that's developed not just nuclear weapons, uh, but now uh, ICBMs that, it, you know, we don't know all their accuracy, but they have the distance to hit uh, the mainland United States. Uh, so our goal is to get the North Koreans to the table in meaningful negotiations. I'm not under the illusion that you're going to immediately succeed in denuclearizing the peninsula, but if you could at least freeze the testing of both the nuclear weapons and the testing of some of the long-range missile missiles, then you, as we all know, would dramatically reduce the threat because if you don't have confidence in your nuclear arsenal or, more importantly, if the adversary who might think of using it doesn't have confidence, it's less likely they would use them. Now, what, what the United States and our allies would be willing to give up in exchange for that, that's an important question. I mean, our, our position is kind of like, you know, they've got to do it. But the reality is uh, we have not succeeded in getting uh, them to do that. And so that is the question that we need to be asking ourselves. But we don't even get to the negotiating table if, in my view, if we don't put this uh, strong pressure on. Um, so let me play devil's advocate for a minute on that because of uh, you know, what, what sanctions can do. I certainly don't think military option is an option at all. I, I, I think uh, we're already deterred from serious military action by the consequences of the action. I, I don't think that is really realistically on the table. But let's assume you know people feel differently. 
But on the North Korea issue, I mean, we are talking as if this uh, man, uh, Kim Jong-un, who is, everybody agrees, a ruthless dictator, no question about that, uh, that he is the central problem in North Korea, that uh, as if you know, we can persuade him or dissuade him, uh, when in fact there are people who think that the anti-Americanism has deep roots in North Korea and goes well beyond the leadership in the regime and beyond the brainwashing uh, that's rooted in the Korean War. Uh, estimates of, of Korea's losses are anywhere from 10 to over 20 percent of the population, mostly civilians mostly blamed on the United States of America. Deep anti-Americanism, deep mistrust. Uh, we have a president that many of us in this country don't seem to trust, let alone around the world. Uh, we've seen the U.S. Uh, carry out wars uh, that were, uh, that were uh, counterproductive for the U.S. And the, uh, and, and the rest of the world, including the Iraq war, uh, which with Iraq not having deterrence. We have people uh, who may be aiming to see a war with Iran down, down the road. Um, and, and they finally have uh, nuclear weapons and the ability to reach American soil. Why would they want to give that up uh, for the promise of, uh, of, of, of sanction relief? What, what, is it in, what is it in it for them that they would, I mean, as Putin, I, I rarely agree with Putin, hate to, to <laughs> quote him here, but he said they'd rather eat grass than give up their nuclear weapons. Now, what, what about that counter-argument? What, what do you I would say that? a couple of things. First of all, there's no doubt that, uh, you know, the North Korean leadership um, views the, has a perception of the United States as a, a threat. Um, and even if they didn't, uh, they have reinforced the already, you know, the feelings of the North Korean people that we are out to get them. And if you're absolutely convinced as a leadership that we are out to get them and we will invade them if they don't have nuclear weapons, then that's obviously an argument they would make. So part of making sure that they are willing to give up those nuclear weapons is to assure them, uh, together with our allies like China, that we have no intention of invading North Korea. And you know, uh, I disagree with the way the administrations handle a lot of this, but Rex Tillerson, Secretary Tillerson, has been right. He starts almost every statement by saying our goal is not to, you know, not to unseat the leadership. It's not to have U.S. troops on the, uh, in the north. We don't want to cross the 38th parallel. So he, he's been very clear in his signaling. Uh, I believe that the, if the North Korean leader wanted to make this change, <laughs> despite the views of the population or the indoctrination over time that uh, you know, you know, Americans are are terrible. He he could do that. Um, you know, we've made agreements with people that you know mm -hmm. our presidents have said terrible things about. Right? Ronald Reagan called the Soviet Union the evil empire, and then he entered into a number of arms control agreements with them. So, uh, so I, I think that the question is, how do you get Kim Jong Un to the negotiating table? It may not work. But you pointed out that the military option is, uh, in, in, in your view, it's just, and it is catastrophic. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what, what do you try? So we really haven't, in my view, exhausted uh, our efforts, especially to get the Chinese to put pressure on North Korea to come to the table. They may not. Uh, and if they don't, uh, then you're going to have a continued potential escalation uh, here. I can tell you, I, I, you know, their theory may be ultimately the United States will say, you know, as we have to some other countries that we said not to develop nuclear weapons like Pakistan, okay. But uh, I don't think we're going to get there. I don't think the United States will ever accept North Korea as a nuclear power. Uh, you know, how, that, how we deal with that is a separate question. Let yeah. me tell you one fun, I, wanna, I do want to tell one story on this issue of um, sort of sentiments toward the United States because I, we had a, a bipartisan delegation that in August traveled to South Korea and China and Japan. Uh, it was led by Senator Markey. And we went to not just the DMZ uh, between North and South Korea, but we went to the Chinese North Korean border at a place called Dandong. And that's where the Yalu River is. And there's something called the Broken Bridge. It's a bridge across the Yalu River, but there's only about half a bridge. And there's a half a bridge because during the Korean War, US planes bombed this 
bridge. If you remember the Korean War, you know, the, you know, the South Koreans were on the verge of defeat. The U.S. forces came in, pushed the North Korean forces uh, northward, got all the way up toward the Yala River, and then the Chinese forces came in. So I'm telling this story because we're out there in the rain. We're, we're, we went to Dang Dang, Dan Dang, because that's where we think a lot of the trade is, cross-border trade between China and North Korea is taking place. So we go to the Broken Bridge, though. It's a rainy day, and there were about 35 elderly Chinese women singing the song in Chinese. And so we asked the interpreter, what are they singing? And they were singing the song about the day we drove the Americans away, right, and drove them back across the bridge and, and saved North. And it is, and this is on the, this is among China, that you're talking about North Korea. So clearly, the, you know, the North Koreans feel uh, that uh, the United States, you know, they remember the Korean War. It was a devastating war. A lot of people were killed. And so uh, it was, but it was interesting to see here on the Chinese side, this sort of, uh, sort of, patriotic song that was talking about the great Chinese victory against the Americans when they came in and drove us back down uh, to where the current uh, border is. It was just, it was a glimpse into the sort of, sort of psychology. But, but at the same time, when you, they said that we were Americans, oh, you're Americans, right? So um, it, it's just interesting to see all the cross currents at play. No question. But, but I, you know, just I, I want to make one final comment on, on North Korea, which is that you know, we either treat, treat them like madmen or like rational. If they're madmen, uh, sanctions aren't going to work because uh, they're, they're just not going to react rationally to what we expect. If they're rational, they will never start a war against us. Uh, and, and that's the logic of mad. And uh, if they're rational, they'll, they'll, they'll abide by it. So I'm not sure whether, you know, we are, uh, you know, our fear is justified and if we take a hard position uh, and, and, and say they could never have, we could never accept the nuclear weapons, whether or not that ties our hands and puts them on a slippery slope towards something we don't want. I just put that out there as a reflection, not as a, I, 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 as, as a, as a uh, something I know, but uh, I, that's one of the worries I have. But tied to that, that's the final question I want to ask you on foreign policy, and that is the Iran nuclear deal. Um, obviously, it's tied to this because uh, you know that was an example of engaging Iran in a in a negotiation that actually ultimately worked to obtain very specific objectives that we had about uh, imposing limits on their nuclear program that at least postponed their nuclear program for many years to come, yeah. and it was and and it has worked uh, well. Everybody says it has worked, except for now we're hearing it hasn't worked from the president or voices around that, uh, that people who want to roll it back or want to renegotiate it, want to open it. Uh, we hear voices from the military saying that would be disastrous if we, if we break an agreement that is, they're abiding by and, and say that they're not doing it. Uh, how is North Korea going to feel if we're going to enter into a new negotiation with them? What is the mood in Congress if the president goes that, through that path of trying to make the case that Iran has not abided by the agreement and wanting to get different measures or negotiations or, or, or break the agreement. Uh, d does, he have, does he have support in Congress, uh, including across the aisle from among your colleagues? So I think this is a really important uh, question, and especially at this moment because of the rumors that the president is not going to certify, continue to certify uh, compliance. And I should thank you for your, your role in helping pass what I think uh, was a agreement very much uh, in the interest of the United States and in the interest of all our uh, allies um, in the region, um, including uh, Israel. And it has succeeded in dramatically reducing the Iranian supply of uranium, including their, some of their stockpiles of more enriched, 20% enriched uh, uranium. They are, by all accounts, abiding by the terms of the agreement. 
That's the finding of the IAEA, the International Monitor. It's also the conclusion of the U.S. government. Uh, you just had the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Dumford, test. He, he just submitted within the last 48 hours written answers to congressional inquiries saying that Iran uh, was complying with the agreement. So it would be, in my view, absolutely outrageous uh, for the United States to go out and just violate <laughs> an agreement that we reached. It would also undermine our any claim that we're going to sit down and try and get the North Koreans to negotiate uh, on a nuclear question, because who would ever trust or believe us then? It will alienate all our allies, um, all the folks who are at the negotiating table, our European uh, partners, um, uh, and, and it would alienate China. Here we're asking China for help on uh, North Korea. And all those countries continue to believe that it is serving our collective security interests. So it would do all those things. Now, given all that, you would think that if the president uh, decides not to certify that Congress would say, oh, you know, of course we're not going to take action uh, to overturn the agreement. Unfortunately, I, I don't have a high level of confidence right now that that will be the case. I don't, I don't know the answer. I know what I hope to be the answer. You'd hope that Congress would not take steps to tear this agreement up. But uh, I don't have a high level of confidence right now. Just so everyone understands the procedure, if the president does not certify that they're in compliance, then within a certain period of time, the Republican leader in the, the one of the leader in the Senate and the Republican leader in the House or their designee can introduce legislation that would reimpose if the president does not certify that they're in compliance, then within a certain period of time, the Republican leader in the, the one of the leader in the Senate and the Republican leader in the House or their designee can introduce legislation that would reimpose all or part of the original sanctions. And then there's a fast track expedited procedure and the Senate and the House would then have to vote on this resolution. And in the Senate, the normal procedures are waived and so it would, it would pass on a 51 vote in the United States Senate. So in order to block this, you have to prevent there from being 51 votes. Uh, I, I worry very much about this becoming a, an incredibly partisan and political issue um, rather than people taking a look at this on the facts. I should, I should stress that, you know, the, the Iran nuclear agreement was targeted at making sure Iran did not develop a nuclear program and nuclear weapons. It, nobody ever said it would prevent Iran from engaging in other kinds of uh, adventures in the region, whether it was supplying Hezbollah or whether it meant they would you know, continue to you know, launch some, some, some missiles. We can, we can and should, in my view, take steps to address those issues. But those issues are not a violation of agreement. And everyone understood that no matter what Iran's doing, it's better to deal with a non-nuclear Iran than with a nuclear Iran. And throwing out the Iranian nuclear agreement would put us in much worse of a situation. We'd be talking about all this potentially down the road, all the military options again on Iran, at the same time people are trying to figure it out on North Korea. So, I hope that everybody, um, you know, will 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 weigh on the weigh in on this. It's been it's important to our national security not to get in a situation where Iran uh, no longer has to comply with its obligations under the Iran nuclear agreement. And they've just said, uh, if Congress took this action, you know, they'd obviously be free of their obligations. If we violate the agreement, they're no longer bound by it. So it would be a huge mistake for the United States uh, to uh, violate that agreement, both with respect to Iran and our relations with others around the world. 
Uh, we'll take a, a few questions from the audience, and we have microphones on both ends uh, uh, right here. So uh, there's a lady right there, if you can give it to her. But before you ask the question, um, this is the Sadat form. And so um, obviously, uh, it was established in the name of Anwar Sadat, and, and partly because of uh, the peace path that he chose. Um, Arab-Israeli peace has not materialized. Uh, and uh, so I, I can't not end with a question on that. Uh, and, and the question I want to ask you is, is really straightforward, which is uh, the President of the United States, to our surprise, decided to make this an issue, a priority issue, good for him, because no one is really pushing for that, for that anywhere, not even in the Arab world, because everybody's distracted with their own things, except for the Palestinians. Who, who really desperately need relief. Uh, and he's doing it. But what we've seen so far is that uh, he is not treating the two-state solution as uh, an outcome of the negotiations. In fact, the rumor, the, the reports uh, that he's telling the Palestinians this is an opening position for you is not the aim of the negotiated two-state solution. Uh, his uh, ambassador in Israel has referred to the West Bank as uh, the alleged occupied territories. So even the occupation isn't recognized. Uh, and so what are your thoughts on this? Uh, uh, in terms of sitting where you are, what is behind the president's move and how is Congress reacting or, or, or your colleagues in Congress reacting to those kind of pronouncements and position is taken on this issue? Well, I must say I'm very confused uh, by uh, the, the president's uh, approach uh, on this issue. Like you, I'm glad he wanted to make it one of his important goals uh, to achieve uh, peace um, in the region. Uh, I think that's an important goal, and you're right. A lot of people were telling him, don't put that idea out there. You're not going to succeed. It may raise expectations. Don't do it. But I do think it needs to be a uh, priority, uh, personally, for uh, us to help facilitate uh, that process. Why do I think he did it? This is just my view of Donald Trump. He thought that, you know, this is a guy who wrote The Art of the Deal and thinks <laughs> everybody else was stupid, and just leave it to him, and he'll find a way to cut a deal with everybody. He looked out across the international horizon, he said, that's a that's a problem people have been trying to solve for a long time, but they haven't met Donald Trump, and I'm going to get it done. Uh, I think he's found out that the art of the deal isn't working for him as well in the public sphere as it did, if, if it did in the private sector, right? His health care effort to destroy the Affordable Care Act uh, fortunately did not succeed, uh, and many other events. But So I see that as his... Uh, Motivation. Not that he doesn't want to solve it, but he just charged out and said, let's solve it and let's put Jared Kushner uh, in charge uh, of this and let's send an ambassador to Israel who doesn't believe in a state to state, state solution, state solution uh, who believes that all of this is part of the biblical state of Israel. So you tell me. You are the expert. I'm going to ask him to answer this uh, uh, question here, but but I think um, uh, look I, again. I, I I support the intention. I think that this should be uh, a a serious goal of uh, U.S. Uh, policy, but I really don't know where it's uh, heading right now. The breath. Uh, not even those who initially supported it in, in the Arab world. Uh, so let's take some questions. Uh, yes, May. Thank please, you. Please uh, uh, identify yourself as you ask the question. Yes. First, thank you for this excellent, excellent, enlightening conversation. I am May Rihani, uh, the director of the Gibran Chair for Values and Peace at okay. UMD, of course. And my question is a follow-up on foreign policy issues. And this time, I'm going to turn my attention to Europe. And we all recognize that Trump alienated many of our traditional allies in Europe. Chancellor Angela Merkel in Germany, Prime Minister Theresa May in Britain. And I think the President of France 
Emmanuel Macron, decided to try to see if he can make Trump change a little bit his uh, tone towards Europe and his positions to, towards Europe, starting with the Paris Agreement, the, cli the Climate Change Agreement. And Macron th thinks that if he can convince Trump to change, the benefits are multiple, including Macron himself will benefit, but also Europe will benefit and the United States will benefit. My question is, what if Macron does not succeed in changing Trump's positions? And according to French uh, media, Le Monde in particular, they say he will not succeed. So no, I, Trump, think, I, I think it's clear. Yeah, it's clear, it's clear so, that he will not succeed. Yeah. So, this so, is, yeah. so he's alienating everybody. What, is, what are we going to do about the fact, in particular the Senate and the Congress, about the fact that he's alienating all of our traditional allies? So let me start with uh, President Macron. I, again, I applaud his intentions. Uh, I, I don't put his effort with a high probability of success. Uh, there are a lot of people who are a lot closer to you know, Donald Trump every day in the White House that would like to help rein in some of these impulses who have not been uh, successful. You probably saw that, uh, I think probably shortly after that meeting, the rumor went out that the United States was going to reconsider its position on the climate agreement, that we were going to try and maybe find a way back in. Within a very quick 24 hours, um, the White House sort of put a kibosh uh, on that idea. Uh, again, hope springs eternal. The reports are people like Gary Cohn are trying to, you know, also persuade the president. But I don't, I don't see a lot. This is, this is the look. The, the the president, to the extent he has a brand here, it is this sort of nationalism. I mean, you remember he, he when the whole debate came up in the UK over the, you know, European Union. He was weighing, he was weighing in there. Uh, he's been weighing in here, you know, on, on a, a whole lot of other similar issues. It's kind of this, you know, America first nationalism. That's his, that's his, to the extent that he has a brand um, and to the extent that he has a base of voters that's sticking with him, in my view, it's over these kind of issues which uh, apply to our foreign policy is this form of nationalism, forget about the international community, you know, you know, go it alone, but also combined with isolationism. It's, it's kind of a mixed strain, right? On the one hand, he said he was against the war in Iraq, but then he, so it's a very muddled, muddled thing, um, as are so many other things. But it's, it's part of his brand that goes to sort of his tough on immigration policy, his refugee, you know, his position on refugee, he's just, you know, he, 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 I don't see him changing in that regard. What do we do as a country? I mean, look, my view is we just got to do our, our, our very best to, to muddle through uh, on this. And, you know, I would hope Congress on a more bipartisan, I, I can tell you on this issue as well, you have a lot of Republican senators who are, you know, kind of appalled, and some of them have said so. Some of them have said so. Uh, publicly, uh, but uh, you know, the, the president, any president, has a lot of free range when it comes to foreign policy, and uh, you just got to find a way to limit the damage. Yeah, and uh, the right, yeah, the gentleman right there. Yes. I'm not sure if it was me, but well, I, I meant the one behind you. But uh, we'll do. We'll both go. Uh, I'll, I'll, um, uh, Bill Lawrence at George Washington University. My question is about the appropriations process and policy towards Middle East and North Africa. Good, closer to the microphone. Sure. So given that Congress doesn't generally pass bills in, in appropriations bills in regular order, I mean, the better part of two decades now, the system's sort of broken. And given the partisanship that we have, um, uh, I, and, and given that we have an administration that wants to cut, for example, the State Department budget by 29 percent, and, and 
you know, I'm very concerned about dropping the ball on Yemen, dropping the ball on Syria and the six countries around it that are accepting all the refugees, dropping the ball on Libya, dropping the ball on Tunisia. And yet it seems like you said there's this critical mass of Republicans who, you know, respond to all these partisan cues, but then when it comes time to spending, they'll pass the omnibus spending bill that keeps the government open, and then they'll sort of sneak in continuity there. Yeah. Is that what we're condemned to for the next three years, to pick a, a time frame, of just broken government that passes omnibus spending bills to get things done? Or, or do you feel that there's any move towards actually having appropriations bill passed in regular order and issues debated in the normal way? So there's, a little, there's sort of good news and bad news on this front, right? Um, the, uh, you're right, well, and, well there's, uh, clearly Congress is not passing appropriations bills uh, the old fashioned way, the way they were supposed to do, one at a time, 13 appropriations bills. Um, we haven't, on the, on the floor of the Senate, I think we, we haven't passed any. We passed a bunch in the Appropriations Committee. I serve in the Appropriations Committee. The House is doing a little better, but you're, you're absolutely right, the uh, likely, uh, result of all this will be for the foreseeable future omnibus appropriation bills. Now, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar and you roll them into one big omnibus bill and you pass that. Now, I understand why you, you, you present that as sort of muddling through for now. Under the current circumstances, um, with the White House budget proposals, if we can pass appropriation bills, omnibus or otherwise, but even omnibus bills that contain adequate funding to support our objectives. <laughs> that is, that's better than the alternative. You mentioned the State Department budget. You're right. I mean, look, they proposed a whopping 34%, close to 34% cut. When they came to the uh, Foreign Operations Subcommittee, the Appropriations Committee, which I serve on, you had bipartisan resistance uh, to Secretary Tillerson's and the President, Obama, uh, President uh, Trump's uh, proposals. Uh, for that, and we are pushing back across the important allies, important foreign assistance programs. Uh, so there's actually been, as you suggested, uh, bipartisan Trump bill. I mean, there's, you know, Maryland, they proposed zeroing out the funding for the Chesapeake Bay program. On a bipartisan basis, Congress is, you know, restoring that funding. So um, right now, I will take it in any shape, <laughs> whether it's on single appropriations bill or, appropriation, or, or omnibus. Now, if we get to December, the government needs a good shutdown. So, you know, if they want to, if they really want to play brinksmanship with the U.S. government, then we're in a whole, we're in different territory that we were back in 2013. Uh, but for now, you know, probably omnibus, but year to year. They're not straight out continuing resolutions. Uh, so there's good news and bad news in that. So uh, let me just take uh, three questions together. Please make them brief uh, because we're running out of time and then I'll um, have the center ask, uh, answer all three after. Uh, so I'm, I wanna take the gentleman because I intended him uh, from uh, the beginning and then I'm gonna come here to this lady and, and then uh, I have uh, you here in the front. Yusuf, uh, please. Hi, Senator. Uh, my name is Salman Ameri. I'm a student at the University of Maryland and intern at the Wilson Center. And um, I work with your campaign, so I'm happy to see you here. <laughs> Thank you. <Yeah>. I'm grateful. <laughs> um, I had a question on, I guess, the United States' end goal in Syria. Um, I kind of think our policy there has been kind of based on inconsistencies, whether it be our, I guess, support to want to see the area, the country turn into a democracy or it being for humanitarian efforts there, given that there have been conflicts that we have not intervened in, who, which required our assistance, or whether that we do, who do repress human rights. And so I just wanted to get kind of your vision on what are, what are really um, our national security interests in Syria? Do they justify, I guess, the intervention that we have had thus far with Donald Trump, for example, um, that's attacking the Air Force That's base. clear, thanks so much. Um, so the um, lady here, and make sure uh, you can also give a microphone here to Yusuf um, for afterwards. The, do you want, we have two, oh, uh, first to her, yeah. Go to Yusuf there afterwards, please go ahead. Uh, thanks very much, Senator. Um, my name's uh, Nupur Tukwalem over here. Hello. Oh, thank you. I see ya. 
Um, I, I think you're, you know, I'm on the second row. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi. Oh, someone in back. <laughs> it's a, the light, the light <laughs> is shining right. in our faces. Sorry about that. So um, I'm from the, see. I'm from the British Embassy. Um, in Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, your party had two very different nominees for president. Um, and I think the Democrats, the Democrats are facing a similar choice on what kind of direction the party wants to take when it comes to certainly the next presidential election. And so I wanted to know which direction you think the party should go in and which direction you think the party will go in. That was, the, thank you for being brief, by the way. That was good. We need that. So uh, my name is Yusuf. I'm an alum here at the University of uh, Maryland. And thank you for your comments today. Uh, one issue support for Israeli policies, and I'm particularly interested in your perspective on this as someone who has not only served uh, in Congress and now in the Senate, but also has worked to elect Democrats in the Congress and the Senate on the congressional uh, campaign committees. I'm sorry, the the, I didn't hear the first part about what policies? Uh, U.S. support for Israeli policies. For Israeli policies, yes. okay. Uh, Israeli military rule over Palestinians is now past the half-century mark to entrench the occupation and its devastating impact on Palestinian life. Polling, including polling done by Professor Telhami, has shown a very significant number of Democrats would support economic action, like sanctions on Israel for violence. A colleague from Maryland, a fellow Democrat, Senator Cardin, has introduced a bill that would punish U.S. persons for advancing certain boycotts of Israel, which is legislation the ACLU slammed for being unconstitutional. I know this is legislation you are not co-sponsoring. Try to make it short. And I thank you for that. Yeah. But in contrast, echoing sentiment among Democrats, stated he believed the U.S. was complicit in occupation and would cut sales to Israel. My question to you is, will you consider doing the same? Take them in order. These are all big issues, right? So I apologize for giving Absolutely. relative. But OK. Um, uh, look, Syria has been, I know this has been said many times before, but it is a fact. I mean, Syria has been one of the toughest states in the United States, uh, and I think the international community has faced. Where do we go from where we are right now? Uh, right now, in Syria, you obviously uh, not only have you know, the Assad government and the Syrian opposition, you have all sorts of foreign powers that are involved in uh, the Syrian civil war. Uh, you've got the Russians, you've got the Iranians, you've got the Turks, you have some of the, you have obviously have the indigenous Kurds, uh, PYD, but you also have, you know, uh, other Kurds who are in neighboring countries uh, who were engaged. So what is the end goal at this point in time in Syria? Uh, number one, I think all parties agree that we got to eliminate ISIS as a threat. I think at least a geographic, territorial threat, and I think that uh, we're making progress on that. Then the question is, you know, who controls the country and what parts of the country? And I, I actually think that you're going to have to have a major international <laughs> sort of uh, negotiation for what you do. Uh, in Syria because you have all these competing powers at play, obviously the United States being one of the others. So my, uh, you know, I would be the first to say and have said from the beginning um, that Assad is a brutal dictator, but I have also asked the question from the beginning, if you take Assad out, what is our plan the next day in Syria? And there are all sorts of other elements within Syrian society that obviously would be engaged in their own separate civil wars. We saw this happen, of course, in Iraq when Saddam Hussein was removed. You had the Shia and the Sunnis and the Kurds, um, you know, all competing for power, and you, you have a pretty uneasy stalemate. So, a bottom line in, in Syria, we, would, we should work toward a stable government that we can try and move over time <laughs> toward one that. Uh, calls for more participation from all elements of the Syrian population. But I, I'm, I can't say I'm confident we're going to get there. There are going to be big fights over control over certain parts of Syria. I mean, there are going to be big fights over control of western Syria where ISIS, uh, if pushed out ISIS. So um, I, I, again, I think that terrible, bloody war and with some kind of stability is to have everybody around a table. Uh, 
uh, both the indigenous parties but also the other players uh, in the region. I think that's the only realistic uh, way to look at it. In terms of the, the future of the Democratic Party, boy, you're going to really get me in trouble with my colleagues. Uh, no, I'm kidding. So uh, look, I think that um, uh, I think there's more agreement in the Democratic Party than may meet the eye, but there are probably some significant, uh, there are probably some, there are obviously some important differences. Uh, clearly, you've got, uh, and I just was talking to Senator Sanders, Bernie Sanders. Um, I, I, I do believe that um, th there's sort of this sort of, you know, false conversation going on within the Democratic Party about whether uh, we have to focus, you know, just on issues of more social issues of in inclusion. I think that we need to do both as a Democratic Party. The Democratic Party has been the party of inclusion. Um, and we need to make sure that we don't abandon those ideals. In fact, I think we need to speak more clearly to you know, the issues that we talked about of division uh, in, in the country uh, and what we want to do. That being said, it's a fact that regardless of you know, what, you know, it's, it's a fact that every group in the United States cares about fundamental things about jobs, and this is where Bernie Sanders, you know, tried to bring a sort of universal message. I don't agree with every one of Bernie Sanders' economic policies necessarily, but I do think that the Democratic Party, if we're going to win back uh, a lot of the voters who voted for Barack Obama twice and then voted for Donald Trump, we're going to have to really focus in like a laser on some of these jobs issues, wage issues, uh, and I do think that this upcoming, although it's always difficult to push through, I mean, the whole healthcare debate is also a debate about economic security. If you don't have access to affordable health care, you're living on the edge all the time. You're one you know, sickness away from being bankrupt. And so I did think this latest debate was interesting because in the country, it wasn't really that political on a party basis. I mean, you found overwhelming majorities of Democrats, independents, and Republicans who were opposed to the proposal to totally roll back the Affordable Care Act. And you had all these non nonpartisan groups, I mean, the American Cancer Society, the American Heart Association, every single patient advocacy group that doesn't represent a party, they just represent patients, <laughs> was against it, nurses against it, doctors against it, hospitals in the cities, in the suburbs. The, in the public mind was really about health care, not about politics. Um, we're going to have a debate now on tax reform. I can tell you that despite everything that's being said uh, publicly, about how this is going to just came from an analysis of the proposal, uh, and it's still a lot of details need to be filled in. But it is definitely disproportionately helping the folks at the very top. And we talked about, you know, the source of frustration so many Americans have experienced, including many who voted for Donald Trump. And I can tell you that if we're able to, what our alternative is, that will be something that unites uh, the Democrats because we need we. We, we need to simplify our tax code, but we should do it in a way that does help folks in the middle and folks who are working their way uh, into the middle class. So I do think those core economic issues are essential. I think that is what you know the, the party will be focusing more on, not to the exclusion of other issues, but I think we neglected uh, some of those issues. As to who will be the standard bearer, it's a long way off. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, on the um, issue of uh, Israel, it goes back to the end and, and peace. Um, it goes, number one, let me start at basic principles. I, I do U.S. policy to try to achieve peace uh, between Israel and Palestine. I believe in a two-state solution, and I need, we believe we need to facilitate uh, that uh, process. Uh, I do not believe in um, stopping U.S. military support for Israel. I think that they're, you know, they, uh, they, <laughs> They still live in a very rough, I think that uh, work Israel if, they're, if they feel af absolutely confident in their military security. And I so would be successful, and so I, no, I don't, I don't uh, support that. Um, with respect to the legislation that you referenced, um, I'm hoping the ACLU has raised some really important points uh, about this, and my interpretation of that legislation is that uh, it, go, it, it does things that, um, 
the sponsors say were not intended uh, in terms of the bill, uh, because I don't think you should uh, any individual. I don't think any American, for example, should be, you know, threatened with fines or imprisonment for e expressing their views in the form of, uh, you know, whether in the form of econ participating in economic. Uh, I do not support that uh, uh, bill, certainly in its current form, and I'm so for the. So that, but I, but I do believe that we need to. We need. You know, I, I wish I could see um, a strategy to complement the intentions expressed uh, by President Trump, because I, I do think that the situation, um, as you know, Shibley and many others have pointed out, the you know we 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 keep talking about a two-state solution, which I believe is the only viable solution. But <laughs> every day that goes by, we know that that solution gets. Harder and harder, and I, you know, I strongly believe it's in the interests of both the Palestinians and Israel to quickly develop that kind of solution, and uh, hopefully we can get back on track. Hopefully one day we'll get there. Um, and I know that uh, you've you've supported uh, a uh, peaceful, equitable resolution for a long time, and hopefully yeah. one day it'll happen. Now um, I think you all uh, could see, uh, if you haven't already seen, why uh, I invited. Uh, uh, Senator Van Hollen, uh, I don't. I really can't think of another congressional leader issues that you do, and uh, and has been uh, thoughtful about them throughout your career. And you've served our state well. You've served our campus well. You've certainly served our country well. And thank yeah. you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you to be here. Thank you, Shibley. Thank you for your uh, own leadership. And thank all of you who are part of the uh, FD Maryland family. We're really proud of uh, all the, everything that's going on uh, here on campus. And, and we are very proud of uh, all the students uh, who are studying here. So go Terps. All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much. Others have pointed out the you know we, we, we keep talking about a two-state solution, which I believe is the only viable solution. But <laughs> every day that goes by, we know that that solution gets harder and harder. And I you know I strongly believe it's in the interests of both the Palestinians and Israel to quickly develop that kind of solution. And uh, hopefully we can get back on track. Hopefully one day we'll get there. Um, and I know that uh, you've you've supported. Uh, a uh, peaceful, equitable resolution for a long time, and hopefully yeah. one day it'll happen. Now, um, I think you all uh, could see, uh, if you haven't already seen, why uh, I invited uh, uh, Senator Van Hollen. Uh, I don't, I really can't think of another congressional leader issues that you do, and, uh, and has been uh, thoughtful about them throughout your career. And you've served our state well. You've served our campus well. You've certainly served our country well. And thank yeah. you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. To be here. Thank you, Shibley. Thank you for your uh, own leadership. And thank all of you who are part of the uh, FD Maryland family. We're really proud of uh, all the everything that's going on. Uh, here on campus, and, and we are very proud of uh, all the students uh, who are studying here. So go Terps. All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was great. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was great.